So first of all, I'd like to um, uh, welcome Dr. Barnett and Khalid Ramadan to our uh, session tonight. And I'm going to give you a brief bio of each of them. So Dr. Barnett was trained in a medical oncology at the St. Bartholomew Hospital in London, England, before joining the Leukemia Bone Marrow Transplant uh, Program in British Columbia in 1986. So he's pretty much been here for a long time. He's now a Vancouverite. He uh, served as a director there from 96 until 2001. And then he went back for two years and spent uh, time at the St. Bartholomew's as a professor of transplantation oncology. And he returned to Vancouver with that expertise in 2003 as head of the division of of hematology at the University of British Columbia. So he spends his professional time overseeing the activities of his division, treating patients with uh, hematologic or blood malignancies, and he has a particular interest in myeloid leukemias, and he's going to explain in more detail what exactly that is. And Dr. Khaled Ramadan, he He's a very well-trained doctor. He's got lots of um, degrees from many uh, countries around this world. Um, he received his medical degree in 97, and he did his internal medicine training in Ireland, and he obtained certificates in the Royal College of Physicians of Ireland um, in internal medicine. And then he did his uh, hematology training with the Royal College of Pathologists in the United Kingdom, and that was in 2004. And then in 2008, he became the Royal College of um, pathologist in the UK, and then he went on to do clinical and research fellowships in lymphoma, leukemia, and as well as bone marrow transplantations in Vancouver between 2005 and 2006. So he joined the Division of Hematology at St. Paul's Hospital in uh, January of 2007, and he's a clinical assistant professor at UBC, and he's very dedicated to clinical research. He has uh, 15 peer-reviewed publications, and I press that button erroneously, so I'll go back. Thank you. Um, and uh, he has clinical research uh, interests in chronic lymphocytic leukemia, which is different from what Dr. Barnett is going to talk about. So I think this is going to be very educational for everyone here. And I'd like to welcome our first speaker, Dr. Barnett. Thank you. Thank you for that very kind introduction. I was very pleased to um, be invited this evening to be part of this, um, of this uh, lecture program. Um, as you've heard, what we would like to do um, this, um, this evening is to, um, to uh, give you some information, some, to begin with some general information, and later we'll give you some specific information um, about the blood cancers. Um, and I've just written down here some of the, the points that, um, that I hope we'll, um, we'll be able to cover uh, in the next 45 minutes, and then also it will come out in the uh, specific questions that you may have for us. First of all, I'd like to show that this is um, a, a significant health problem. Uh, second, a recurring theme through the talks will be that uh, the problems that we're going to talk about, the blood cancers, arise from normal blood cells. We won't be able to tell you uh, why that happens, but we'll, uh, we, we will be able to talk about that generally. Um, the third point is that there are several different types and subtypes uh, of these diseases. Um, but if you combine them all, uh, they come out to be about the fourth most common cancer in, in, in British Columbia. So the top um, would be either breast or prostate followed by um, lung, followed by colorectal, and then fourth would be this group of cancers that I've called, we call the blood cancers. Causation, we won't be able to answer all that many questions on this, but we will show you that we believe that there are genetic and also environmental factors at play here. In terms of the management of these diseases, there can be a whole range. We'll point out that in some situations, all that is required is a certain time, depending on the tempo of the disease, is a period of observation, right the way through to treatments that um, requiring radiotherapy, chemotherapy, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about transplantation. And then finally, we want to make the point that over the last 10 years, there's been significant improvement in our knowledge of, about all of these diseases, and we are now in a position to exploit that knowledge to develop uh, 
new treatments. And we believe that these new treatments, the important of the, these new treatments is that they are not only more effective, but also less toxic. Um, so with that as a background, uh, this is a beautiful picture. It's an um, electron uh, from an electron microscope. Uh, just and the, the point that I want to make really is that the cells that, that you see here, which uh, are the blood cells, a red cell here, um, this is a, a lymphocyte, monocyte, and then these purple cells uh, are, um, uh, are platelets. So th what you see in front of you here uh, um, are basically most of the blood cells, and the, the, they have three major functions. One is to transport oxygen and other substances to the cells and take away from the cells substances to be got rid of. Second, um, the white cells form an important protection uh, uh, for the body against infection and also invading uh, other uh, invading uh, organisms and perhaps also a surveillance of malignant cells. And thirdly, the platelets uh, and the coagulation system uh, protect against bleeding. And we'll come, up, we'll come back about, talk about all of those um, issues later. So um, I'm going to give you a little background in the first three slides, some important information uh, about the various normal tissues that, um, that um, can become abnormal and generate disease. So on the left-hand side, um, I've just shown here in this, uh, this skeleton, the areas of red represent the, the, uh, where we would find act active bone marrow. So the bone marrow is the spongy material on the inside uh, of bone. And uh, basically, it makes all the blood cells. So within the bone marrow are the stem cells, the very early cells, which are capable of making uh, all the cells that come out into the blood. So um, if we're, I'm sure within this audience, there are uh, some individuals who've actually um, uh, had a bone marrow sample taken. And you will know that, um, if that is the case, that the sample is usually taken um, from, from the pelvis. Uh, and uh, it can also be taken from the sternum. So but you can see the, the sites where the, the marrow is active. The, this panel here shows you what the, the pathologist, if Dr. Ramadan is putting on his pathology hat as opposed to his clinical hat, looks down the microscope. This is what he sees in terms of a marrow sample. This is the bone that's actually just cut in section. The, the pink material is the active marrow where all the cells are. And the, the, apparently the white dots here are fat, um, fat spaces. So um, here you see, as you can see, about 50% of the space is the pink material or the marrow where the stem cells are. And from the marrow are all the blood cells. So the panel here shows you what the blood looks like down the microscope with these the most common cell here, the red cells. This is a lymphocyte. Um, sorry. Um, uh, a neutrophil. And the very small cells that are clustered together here are the platelets. So that's what we would see down the microscope of a, a normal blood picture. It is also possible as part of the marrow sample to take it and actually grow the cells, get them to divide, and then we can look at the chromosomes. So the bottom panel here just shows you this is um, uh, a male taken from a male patient because this is uh, uh, an X and a, a large X chromosome and the small Y, so this is an XY. Uh, this is a normal carrier type, so there are 46 chromosomes, they're normal. Uh, and one of the points we'll make uh, in the talk is that um, quite a number of these diseases, the blood cancers, when they are formed, uh, an abnormality develops in the malignant cell, uh, a chromosomal abnormality, which is then passed on to the cells that arise from it. And we can use that as a marker for the disease. And also, it's quite an effective way, uh, depending on what the abnormality is, is trying to predict the prognosis for a particular patient. And thirdly, and this has been happening in the last 10 years, the knowledge about these chromosomal abnormalities has led us to develop more, a more rational, have a more rational approach to developing uh, treatments that can be targeted against the malignant cell, hopefully sparing the um, the normal cells. So, um, so that's the marrow and blood. The other important system 
uh, the lymph nodes on the spleen. Um, and uh, those of you with an artistic inclination will know that I've defaced this uh, Michelangelo's David. And um, you will also know that, um, of course, um, Michelangelo ventured south here, but I thought uh, this would be a, quite a sensitive audience, so I've cut that off around here so we can just look north of this border. And I put on here typical sites for lymph nodes. Um, and we, we all have lymph nodes, and you, you know, if you get um, a sore tooth or infection somewhere, you might get a node in the neck. That is a normal response to an infection. Or if you, you know, get a, an infection in the foot, you might get a node here in the groin. There are other sites for the nodes that you may not be aware of. Uh, within the chest, of course, you can't feel the node there, but we can see it on an X-ray. So we can, we can, there are nodes in the chest and also in the belly. So uh, sometimes if they're large enough, the ones in the belly we can actually feel on examination. Um, and you should regard the spleen, uh, which is here on, the, uh, on the, the left side here, protected by the ribs as a large lymph node. If it enlarges, it goes from top left to bottom right, so as a, in a diagonal. But normally, we would not be able to feel it if we put a hand on the belly, because it's protected by the ribs. So here's the spleen. That's what it looks like, and that's where it is. And this is just a picture of a lymph node showing that this is a normal lymph node sh showing the different sections. There's a, a follicle here. So if uh, a, a lymphoma arises from this area, it's a follicular lymphoma. Um, there are T-cell areas and there's a marginal area. So again, to make the point that this is normal tissue, but if a, a cancer arises from it, it will arise because of changes to the normal tissue. And, and there are different subtypes according to where it arises from and the specific um, cell that it arises from. The other uh, uh, um, organs that we have to be aware of in hematology uh, are the bones. This is a, on the left-hand side, as you look, is um, just looking, it's a, it's a bone scan. Just I merely put this up, this is a normal one, just to show you and to make the point that the bones can be involved uh, in myeloma. Uh, and also, and if you, if, you, if you look closely, actually, on this bone scan, these are two, two totally separate scans, but you can actually see the kidneys here. Most of the, uh, the trace material has gone into the bone, but you can actually see the kidneys. And then if you move across, there's, again, a totally different way of getting the pictures of the kidneys, but you can see the kidneys here with a collecting system. This is a normal um, IVP. But again, to make the point, with certain diseases, um, can, uh, blood cancers, the bone and the kidney will be involved, particularly uh, in myeloma. And also make the point from this, if the kidney is involved in myeloma, we actually want to avoid doing an IVP uh, for fear of making the kidney function worse. Um, so um, what are the types of blood cancers? So um, there, there's a whole range uh, from leukemia, uh, myelodysplasia or myelodysplastic syndrome, lymphoma, and myeloma. And we can look and find the actual cell from which these diseases come. And uh, for the leukemias, it can be a lymphoid or a myeloid. So it can uh, uh, be, for example, acute lymphoblastic leukemia or chronic myeloid leukemia or chronic lymphocytic. But these are the, the, the normal cells that develop an abnormality and from which the cancer develops. Myelodysplasia arises from a myeloid cell and there is marrow dysfunction which uh, translates into a marrow that looks very active and it looks as though it should do much better in terms of making blood cells than it actually does. So quite typically patients in this with this disease present with low counts even though the marrow looks really quite active. And also uh, this, um, this problem can uh, in some patients uh, transform into acute myeloid leukemia. The lymphomas uh, arise from lymphoid tissue in lymph nodes and myeloma, uh, or multiple myeloma, arises from an immune cell called a plasma cell. These are the cells that make antibody. And uh, the abnormal plasma cells will make an abnormal protein, an immunoglobulin, that we can actually follow and monitor the course of the disease. So how, um, how frequently do these um, problems occur in British Columbia? We're fortunate to have a very good uh, BC Cancer Registry 
which has been in an existence since the late 1960s. And if you look in the cancer registry, these are the figures you come up with. So all types of leukemia, about 600 a year, myelodysplasia. This, I, I've taken a bit of a liberty here because the actual BC cancer statistics say about 120, but actually I, I think the figure is probably more like 200 or even more than that. All the lymphomas together, about 1,000. Myeloma, about 200. So in a year, if you look at all the blood cancers, there are about 2,000 new cases, which um, if, if you do the maths, that comes out to about 40 new cases a week or between five and six a day. So I would call that a significant health problem in terms of the size of the problem, but as we'll come on to sh show later, in terms of the management uh, and, um, and our search for better treatments. Um, what about causation? All I would say about this is that for the average patient coming through the door, when we see them, we are unable to, we are able to tell them what the problem is, but we are unable to say what has actually caused it. That's, that is not to say um, that there isn't a cause. It's just that um, at, at the moment we're unable to say exactly what it is. This is quite a nice uh, uh, slide produced by our colleague John Spinelli at the Cancer Agency. And he's basically just showing um, that perhaps um, there are different populations of patients uh, you know, amongst us, some with a sort of resistant uh, 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 um, to, to, the, to the development of cancer. So at a, at a high exposure, there's not a particularly high risk of getting the problem, whereas there is probably for genetic factors a susceptible population who have a significantly higher risk of developing a particular cancer at perhaps a relatively low exposure to an environmental factor. But as I say, for the majority of patients at the moment, we can tell them what the problem is, but not the cause. And uh, so how do um, patients present? Um, so I think this is fairly straightforward, you know, just knowing what the background information, what the marrow and the blood does. So obviously, if um, with these diseases, quite often patients present with a compromised marrow function. So the, the ability to produce red cells is reduced. They're anemic and they get tired and short of breath. Um, they, their immune system and the, the neutrophils, the cells that fight infection early, are compromised. They get infection and the platelets are affected. Uh, or, or the coagulation system, and they get bleeding. There may be other symptoms, weight loss, fever, and sweat, which, sweats, which are typical for the lymphomas. On examination, we may find enlarged lymph nodes and a big spleen. Um, as I've said, sometimes the, um, the bone and uh, the kidney are involved. This is particularly related to this disease myeloma, where the, marrow, uh, the bone can be directly involved. There may be uh, kidney impairment and metabolic disease, for example, with a high calcium, which can cause major problems. Other sites can be involved with all of these diseases, including the liver, the lung, uh, and the nervous um, system. Um, so um, what about management? Well, um, there are some, I think, important points to make. Making the di this, this may sound obvious, but making the, di the correct diagnosis is very important. And we've, we quite often forget that part of our team are the pathologists, and they play uh, an incredibly important part in actually telling us what the problem is, either on, from a piece of a node uh, or... Um, or from a liver, or, 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 or from a marrow. And um, I know in um, the, um, the, uh, the Royal College of uh, Pathologists uh, in England, trying to raise the profile of pathology, has described uh, uh, pr pathology uh, as being the science behind the cure, meaning the, 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 the link with the clinicians and and the treatments that we give is, 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 a, is very close and very important. Now, there are obviously a, a number of general measures, keeping well hydrated, uh, avoiding certain medications, for example, that can affect platelet function, like aspirin, which we, um, this is advice we give to patients. Supportive care, we would include here the, uh, the treatments that we give to replace uh, or try and replace the red cells and the platelets, for example, that the marrow is incapable of making and also giving antibiotics to treat infections. Alternative therapy, we're quite often asked, uh, you know, is it okay to make this change in the diet or to take uh, 
some uh, supplements. I usually tell patients, as provided I've been able to find out what it is and run it by the pharmacy, if there's no interaction with what I'm doing, I don't usually have a problem with this. And um, I suspect at least 50% of my patients are taking something other than I'm prescribing. I don't actually care as long as it's not doing any harm, and I don't really mind as long as someone's getting better. If it's getting better because of a combination of what I'm doing and some alternative therapy, then that is fine. I've already mentioned that sometimes a period of observation is important just to get an idea of the tempo um, of the disease. So what I've, I've done is I've sort of tried to show this in the form, uh, if you think of a blood cancer, as some abnormal cells within the marrow and the lymph node system, rather like you might consider uh, some weeds that are growing in your lawn. And so there quite often is this period of, uh, there may be a period of observation uh, to try and define exactly what the, the weed is and how it might need to be treated. And also for some diseases, like chronic lymphocytic leukemia, um, it may be possible to just have a period of observation without where, or low-grade lymphoma where a treatment is not required. However, uh, for the most patients, treatment will be required, and this can be divided up into radiotherapy, uh, where, for example, if the disease is localized to an area of the neck, it's possible to deliver a beam of radiation to that site. And so um, that is what I'm referring to as local treatment. If the disease, as it quite often is, is widespread, then uh, chemotherapy may be required, and that I call that systemic therapy. The most aggressive form of treatment is a, a transplant, which I'll mention briefly, but I also want to stress what we're trying to come up with are these newer treatments, so-called targeted therapy, where we are exploiting the knowledge that we've learned about the disease to develop more rational therapy. Um, so this might be... Uh, this is the sort of thing that I'm capable of, but little else, but in the garden, that is. So this, um, this might be an approach to a certain type of leukemia where we're giving a drug which is actually controlling the disease, but we can still see the disease in the blood. And that, uh, quite often, we actually do that. If this treatment um, resolves uh, symptoms and, uh, and brings about reasonable control, sometimes that is a perfectly reasonable option. Of course... On other occasions, we, we take a much more aggressive approach with chemotherapy and we combine drugs, and our goal then is to try and bring about a remission. And a re the definition of remission is where we take a patient with a disease, give a give a treatment, in this, in this case I'm talking about combination chemotherapy, and then the follow-up tests show no evidence of disease. So, for example, if this were a leukemia, we would repeat the marrow and it would look normal. Of course, it is possible in that situation that uh, it looks normal, but it's, there is still disease below the level of what we can detect. And in that situation, the disease will come back again later. But there are other situations where it's undetectable because it's actually gone away, in which case the patient will be cured. The most aggressive treatment, of course, is to dig the lawn up and uh, replace it. So, um, and replace it uh, with a new... Um, lawn. And um, of course, the equivalent of this is a transplant. And um, there are different types of transplant. One is where we use a donor. And, uh, and, we, and, and uh, in that situation, we can either give what we call an ablative therapy. This is very aggressive treatment for about a week to empty the marrow and then replace it with the donor cells. More recently, in the last 10 years, we've uh, been able to adopt, as other groups have, so-called reduced intensity transplant where we're not trying to completely empty the marrow and be, because of that is the case we don't have to be as aggressive with our chemotherapy and radiation and we call that a non-ablative transplant and the donor can be either related to the patient or can be an unrelated volunteer. In some situations of some diseases for example Hodgkin's disease and germ cell tumor um, we uh, consider doing a transplant using the patient's own cells after we've taken them and, uh, and, and frozen them and then thaw them and give them back. So the, the, the actual source of the cells, uh, from what I previously said, I, we can actually get the stem cells from the marrow. So this is uh, what you don't see as a patient. So the top end is the anesthetist. These are 
the two hematologists taking the marrow, and this is a patient uh, uh, lying on his or her belly, and we're taking marrow from multiple punctures of the pelvis. Um, what we found is that the stem cells can actually be moved from the marrow into the blood with a growth factor, and so for the most transplants nowadays, we actually don't have to give an anesthetic to the donor, and we can just give the growth factor, move the stem cells from the marrow into the blood, and then collect um, on a, a cell separator, which is a bit like a washing machine, not that I know much about those either, like rather like the lawn, but um, this will spin at a certain rate and take out the stem cells and then the rest of the blood is returned to the other arm. What you can't see very well is one line here and one line um, uh, at the, um, at the other, in the other arm. So, so that's a transplant. We will, if asked questions later, uh, be able to tell you some of the pros and cons of that. But what we're really trying to do is through, and there are various definitions of translational research, but what we'd like to do is to increase our knowledge of a particular disease and use that knowledge to develop a, a new treatment. And particularly what we're trying to do is to try and find a target on the disease which is crucial to the maintenance of the disease. And then hopefully we can develop a treatment which is targeted against that abnormality. And if we do that, the treatment will hopefully be more effective and less toxic. And uh, th that's basically what we would do. We would have a specific poison which is uh, effective against the weed but not the lawn. That's basically what we would very much like to do and what Dr. Ramadan will explain we've made some inroads into in the last 10 years. So the, the, the really the drug that uh, exemplifies this is a drug called Gleevec which, or, or imatinib which was developed uh, against a particular abnormality found in a disease called chronic myeloid leukemia, an abnormality called the Philadelphia chromosome. And our knowledge of this abnormality increased through the, um, through the 70s and 80s such that uh, this drug could be developed specifically against that abnormality and, uh, and it's been hugely effective. But um, there are other advances as well that you will um, going to hear about now. Thank you very much for um, inviting me um, this afternoon um, to talk to you about the um, management of hematological um, cancers. Um, as you can see, my slides are not as colorful as um, Dr. Barnett, and uh, I don't have really many pictures, so uh, please don't fall asleep. Um, so the uh, first cancer that I'm going to talk about, you know, each cancer um, separately, and um, I will start with the lymphoma. Um, as you saw, lymphoma is perhaps um, a common cancer. It's the fifth uh, most common cancer, and uh, we see around 1,000 new patients per year um, in in the BC. So. Um, when we talk about lymphoma, we have two types of lymphoma. We have non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and we have Hodgkin's lymphoma. And that's a diagnosis that the pathologist actually makes in the lab. Um, but we clinicians, when we see the patient, then based on the pathology and based on um, other clinical um, factors, we decide um, whether the patient has a low-grade lymphoma or an aggressive lymphoma, like intermediate-grade lymphoma or high-grade lymphoma. And that's, of course, very important because that will decide whether you will need to give the patient treatment um, immediately or not and what kind of treatment um, you would like to give the um, patient. Um, so if we talk about um, low-grade lymphoma, which is, again, you know, it's a pathological diagnosis. It's the pathologist who look at the lymph node and decide on the um, grade of the lymphoma, if it is aggressive or not. And again, you know, the, the, you know there are um, other um, clinical factors that helps us to decide whether the treatment is needed immediately or not. But in general, um, low-grade lymphoma is a disease that we cannot cure. Um, it is a disease that we um, tend not to, give, not to give any treatment until the um, patient becomes symptomatic. So the aim of the treatment is to control the symptoms 
Um, and we also, you know, there is an evidence now that the treatment can also prolong survival. Um, the um, treatment can um, range from um, a period of observation, as Dr. Barnett um, explained, um, to supportive treatment, like um, controlling the symptoms by being killers or um, blood transfusion, et cetera. Um, localized radiotherapy, especially if the disease is localized, um, or chemotherapy, a combination of chemotherapy. Um, the major advances in the past 10-15 um, years was the addition of um, the rituximab, which is a newer um, drug. It's an antibody. Um, it's like a magic bullet that attacks the lymphoma cells. Um, as you know, chemotherapy is indiscriminate um, treatment, so it attacks the um, abnormal cells as well as the normal cells. Um, the addition of teritoximab actually to the combination chemotherapy has um, improved the response rate, has improved the duration of the remission, and also has improved the survival um, of those patients. Um, that would be the first-line treatment when the patient needs treatment. Having said that, um, in the past year or so, um, although we, you know, we advise that patients with low-grade lymphoma don't receive treatment, now there are studies showing that even those who are not symptomatic might benefit from the treatment with the rituximab alone. Rituximab is not very toxic. It's very well-tolerated medication. And even those who don't have symptoms with low-grade lymphoma can benefit from um, treating them with the rituximab um, on a weekly basis for four weeks. That can um, delay the need for um, or to start treatment um, and keeps them um, um, you know, asymptomatic for a longer period of time. The um, other type of lymphoma is intermediate-grade lymphoma, which is a more aggressive type of lymphoma. Um, this type of lymphoma, um, you are talking about mainly a subtype called diffuse large basal lymphoma, which um, constitutes about 40% of all lymphoma cases. Um, this is a disease that if we don't cure, it's going to progress, and patients um, can die within a year. Um, without treatment or will die within a year without treatment. Um, it can be cured in about 70% of cases. So the aim of the treatment in this particular disease is to cure the patient. Um, it's a high cure rate. I mean, there isn't really many cancers that respond to a treatment, chemotherapy, and you achieve that kind of um, a cure rate. 70% we consider it really very good. Um, the standard treatment, first-line treatment, is a combination of chemotherapy medications uh, plus rituximab. And again, you know, the um, improvement in the survival actually was because um, since early um, 2000, 2001, um, there are studies um, that shown that adding rituximab to the combination chemotherapy actually improves the survival. So that's the standard treatment, chemotherapy plus the rituximab which is the monoclonal antibody that attacks the lymphoma cells. Um, of course, you know, we have um, cases with intermediate-grade lymphoma that relapses. Um, about 10% of, of lymphoma patients or non-Hodgkin's lymphoma are refractory, and those patients are really very difficult to um, manage. Um, you either, you know, um, switch them to palliative treatment or supportive um, uh, supportive palliative treatment, um, or if there is a study or investigational medications, um, there would be candidates um, um, for clinical studies. Um, those who relapse after um, a period, and most of patients who relapse actually relapse within a year, 90% of patients with lymphoma who relapse actually relapse within the first year of treatment. Um, those can be um, treated with more intensive treatment, salvage treatment, uh, plus minus um, stem cell transplantation, which is an aggressive treatment. And you can risk you on average about 50% of patients using this approach. Um, the very high-grade lymphoma, um, like Perkett's lymphoma, it's uh, rare. 
um, it's very aggressive. Um, those patients are treated as inpatients. Um, again, you know, um, if you don't treat them, their condition actually deter deteriorates very quickly, and most of patients um, die within weeks or a um, couple of months. Um, the cure rate is um, about 50, 60%. And um, this is a disease that we um, give lots of treatments, including um, a treatment directed to protect them from um, a central nervous system infiltration or brain infiltration. So um, I talked about the rituximab, and that's, I guess, the major innovation or the new medication that made the management of lymphoma in general different. Um, it is a targeted therapy um, against um, lymphoid cells. CD20 is an antigen that it is expressed on the lymphoma cells and the lymphoid cells, and it targets this antigen specifically. Um, it was first approved by FDA in 1997 as a second-line therapy for patients with follicular lymphoma who are refractory to other treatments, but um, it was clearly um, obvious to everyone, very obvious to everyone that this um, medication is very well tolerated um, and it doesn't really add very much to the toxicity of the treatment and it does improve the response rates and the survival. So it was incorporated into many um, uh, other chemotherapy regimens and it became part of most of the chemotherapy regimens that we use nowadays um, to treat lymphoma. It is an expensive treatment. Um, each dose of rituximab roughly costs around $4,000. Um, it is funded by the BC Cancer Agency. We are lucky to have this drug funded and covered. Um, it's one of many actually expensive medications that the BC Cancer Agency um, fund. Um, Hodgkin's lymphoma, it is um, another type of lymphoma, it is rare. When you talk about lymphoma, about 90% of cases of lymphoma are non-Hodgkin's. About 10% are Hodgkin's. Um, it affects younger patients, and um, it is highly curable disease. About 90% of patients with um, Hodgkin's lymphoma can be cured by a combination chemotherapy that was um, first um, uh, approved or designed by Italians and um, that's in uh, uh, late uh, 1980s, early 1990s, and it became the standard of care. Um, those who relapse after this treatment, um, we give them salvage intensive chemotherapy plus um, uh, stem cell transplantation. Um, of course, you know, um, when you achieve that high your rate, you always get worried about toxicity and the side effects of the treatment. So nowadays, people are looking at, you know, how can you um, reduce the um, side effects of the treatment and maintain the same cure rate? And the studies are going on, and um, uh, it is more like, you know, manipulations of the um, treatment and try to reduce the intensity of the treatment or the number of cycles that we give for this disease in order to reduce the toxicity. Um, chronic lymphocytic leukemia um, is another lymphoid malignancy. Um, we have a database at samples where we have about 500 patients, and when we looked at it, we um, found that only about one-third of patients with a chronic lymphocytic le leukemia actually will require treatment um, during their um, disease course. It's a disease that affects, you know, um, patients uh, mostly above age of 60. The median age is about 70. Um, but the majority of patients actually will never require treatment um, um, with this disease. So it's going to be more like observation and um, those who don't require treatment, we tend to check their blood counts, you know, um, three, four times per year. Um, we see them once a year um, just to keep an eye on them. Um, but the majority of patients, as you can see, will never require treatment. Those who require treatment, actually this disease cannot be cured. And those who require treatment, they become symptomatic from the disease. And they drop their um, hemoglobin, they become anemic, or they drop their... A platelet count, um, or they develop extensive um, lymph node enlargements, 
um, night sweating, fever, um, any symptoms that you know um, can be attributed to the chronic lymphocytic leukemia, we give them a combination of um, fludarabine and rituximab, uh, plus minus other medications. But the fludarabine and rituximab, these are the two medications that are proven to be highly effective in chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Again, you know, um, when you give this treatment, you give it on, say, a monthly basis for eight cycles maximum, and then you stop, and then you observe the patient. Uh, most of patients stay in remission on average for about five to uh, uh, four to five years, um, which is very good. You know, um, the disease is quiet and stays in remission for a number of years, and when the disease comes back, then we can treat them with the same um, treatment. Uh, multiple myeloma is another um, bone marrow cancer um, that has many complications. Um, it can affect the bones, you know, cause bone fractures. Um, also, it can produce an abnormal protein in the blood that affect the kidneys and cause kidney failure, um, as well as affect the bone marrow function and the immune system and makes the um, patient at risk of infections. Um, the management plan will depend more or less on the age of the patient. At the moment, um, patients who are eligible for bone marrow transplant, autologous stem cell transplant, um, actually they go this route. Um, so we um, give them a high-dose melphalan, which is one dose of chemotherapy, high-dose chem chemotherapy, followed by the autologous stem cell transplant. The stem cells are collected from the patient, frozen, and after they get the high-dose melphalan, they are given the, their stem cells back. Um, it is a treatment that carries um, some mortality. The mortality rate is about 2%. It depends, of course, you know, on the performance status of the patient and if the patient has comorbidities or other diseases. Um, but it is a procedure that is done by the leukemia BMT uh, program at VGH, and it's mostly done as an outpatient. Patients who are um, above age of 70, we have so many newer agents um, uh, that are became available, or they are in the pipeline, actually, for multiple myeloma. Um, one of them is Divilcade or Bortezomib. The other one is Linalidomide or Revlimid. Um, Teledomide is another one, which I guess many of you um, know the story of Teledomide um, back in 1960s where babies um, born without limbs. Now, um, in late 1990s, actually, we found that teledomide is effective in multiple myeloma. So it is back um, in the market with different price, of course. It's a lot more expensive. Um, bomelidomide is another one. So we have so many newer medications. So at the moment, you know, even we are not so keen on pushing for the stem cell transplant because with these newer agents, the response rates and the duration of the response and the quality of the response is probably as good as um, stem cell transplant with this in your agents. So, and um, and uh, again, we are very lucky that the BC Cancer Agency funds these um, um, those expensive medications. Uh, myelodysplastic syndrome is another bone marrow. Um, uh, failure syndrome, where the patient can develop anemia, um, low blood, ca uh, low platelet count, low white cell count. Um, they can be at risk of bleeding um, and infection. Um, so their management actually depends on uh, the uh, disease stage or um, uh, the disease risk. So we classify the myelodysplastic syndrome into low risk disease and high risk disease. And the low-risk disease usually tend to not to treat. Um, we uh, watch them. Um, it depends on the degree of the anemia or the low blood counts. They might need some supportive treatment, like blood transfusion. Um, we can give um, also um, uh, growth factors, um, like the uh, white cell hormone injections, and platelet hormone injection, or white or uh, red cell uh, uh, hormone injections. Um, there is a subgroup of patients with the lowest disease. It's called 5Q um, minus or deletion. Those patients respond very well to nenalidomide. Those patients tend to be very anemic. 
and the response rates to lenalidomide or Revlimid is very good. Um, having said that, the average duration of response is about um, um, 18 months or two years, and after that they lose um, their response to this medication and they become transfusion dependent again. Um, the high risk uh, myelodysplastic um, uh, disease um, patients, um, those are a little bit difficult to manage. Um, in the past, actually, we had nothing to offer them. Um, those who are young and fit, we send them for um, bone marrow transplant. Um, but those who are, um, are not fit for bone marrow transplant, they are basically uh, managed palliatively and by supportive care. And um, many patients actually die within 12 to 18 months with high-risk disease. Um, lately, we, um, a new medication became available. It's called azacitidine or videza. Um, again, it's a very expensive medication, but certainly it had made um, the, a difference in the management of high-risk um, myelodysplastic syndrome. Um, and certainly, um, this, this medication has made um, uh, patients' blood counts better and um, improved survival as well. So um, again, you know, there are advances in myelodysplastic syndrome. Linalidomide is a newer medication. Azacitidine is a newer medication. And um, the research is actually um, going on looking for more um, medications to manage this disease. Um, another um, bone marrow cancer is a group of diseases called myeloproliferative disorders. They are not as dramatic as many other um, blood cancers, but certainly um, it's a group of diseases that needs management and it comes to uh, um, our way, you know, patients, and um, uh, we manage them here at St. Paul's. Um, one of them is called polycythemia vera. Um, this disease carries a risk of clotting. Um, so in order to reduce the risk of clotting, either venous or arterial, arterial we um, try to reduce the hemoglobin level by phlebotomy, taking blood from time to time. Um, on average, patients with this disease require about you know, four to five phlebotomies per year as a maintenance, as well as we give them antiplatelet treatment, which is the aspirin, um, to reduce the risk of clotting. Um, other disease called essential thrombocytemia, um, which is basically increase in the um, platelet count. Polycythemia vera is basically increase in the hemoglobin level. Essential thrombocytemia is an increase in the platelet count. And again, this disease um, increases the risk of clotting, um, both arterial and venous. Um, it depends on the other risk factors for clotting. The patient may need or may not need antiplatelet agents like aspirin, and we may or may not need to reduce the platelet count by giving them some treatment um, like hydroxyurea to reduce the, or anigralite to reduce the uh, platelet count. Um, another condition called myelofibrosis, and when you think about myeloproliferative diseases or neoplasms, myelofibrosis has perhaps the um, worst prognosis. Um, 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 certainly, essential thrombocytemia and polycythemia if are managed properly, they don't affect the survival. Um, whereas myelofibrosis, it's a disease that um, can cause lots of symptoms. Um, patients can uh, lose weight, have um, lots of um, other problems, big spleen, anemia, and they can be transfusion dependent. Um, in the past, we had the supportive care, um, which is basically blood transfusion for the anemia. Um, some patients undergo splenectomy, um, but um, many researchers are working on a, a newer class medications called JAK2 inhibitors, um, which I guess you know they are gonna become available um, pretty soon. Um, we have participated here in St. Paul's in one of these um, clinical studies, um, which is uh, uh, now closed, but. Um, these medications are going to become available in the market, um, I think, fairly soon. Um, another disease is chronic myeloid leukemia, and that's one of the um, blood malignancies uh, 
where the management has actually changed dramatically um, over the past 15 years. Um, I guess before year 2000, the um, management of chronic myeloid leukemia was allogeneic bone marrow transplant. And that's, of course, you know, it's a, an intensive procedure. Um, it carries a significant risk of uh, mortality, and in this disease, it's about 10 to 15 percent. Um, people die as a result of the procedure. And uh, morbidity, because it also, it can cause another disease, which is um, graft versus host disease or chronic graft versus host disease. Um, since um, year 2000 or around that, um, newer medications, um, like the uh, Dr. Barnett actually referred to the magic bullets, which are targeting the disease um, called tyrosine kinase inhibitors, like a matinib, the satinib, and nolatinib, um, became available. And these medications actually have changed the management of this disease. So um, um, the disease can put in remission, and there are very high remission rates using these medications. Um, having said that, the patient will need to stay on the medications. We tend not to stop these medications because if you stop them, the disease can come back. So we look at the chronic myeloid leukemia like any other chronic diseases. You know, if you have high blood pressure or diabetes, you need to take your medications to control the disease. Um, if you stop the medications, you know, um, the disease will come back. Um, but certainly these, new, these medications have changed the management um, of uh, these medications have changed the management of chronic myeloid leukemia. They are expensive. The imatinib, one tablet per day costs around $115. The satinib is even more expensive. It costs around $150 per day. So they are quite expensive medications. And again, we are lucky that the BC Cancer Agency actually fund these medications. Um, acute leukemia, um, again, it depends on the acute myeloid leukemia. It depends on the age. Um, of the patient, um, those who are um, less than um, 60 years and have a good performance status, we tend to treat them with intensive chemotherapy, and it depends on their prognosis. You know, there is a good prognosis and poor prognosis. The patients with good prognosis um, 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 can be treated with intensive chemotherapy alone, um, but those with um, poor prognosis, they require um, allogeneic bone marrow transplant. Um, those who are above age of 70 don't tolerate the intensive treatment, so um, we tend to give them palliative treatment, supportive treatment, or enroll them into clinical studies if available. Um, there are some newer medications that are going to perhaps um, target this group of patients who cannot be treated intensively, like Videza or azacitidine and clofarabine. Um, the acute lymphoid or lymphoblastic leukemia, um, it has poor outcome in adults. Um, if you look into kids, which is, this disease is, of course, more common in children, and children have a very high cure rates, you know, and you are talking about more than 90% of childhood acute lymphoplastic leukemia can be cured by chemotherapy alone. Um, in adults, the outcome is poor, um, and the reason for that, the disease tends to come back and relapses. Um, the chemotherapy is usually prolonged. Um, it takes about two years to complete the courses of the chemotherapy, but certainly if we find um, a match for the patient, we tend to um, get um, patients into allogeneic transplant because at the moment, I think, you know, th there isn't really um, other options for this disease. Now, switching gears. Um, this is our group um, here at um, St. Paul's Hospital, Dr. Um, Jackson, Dr. Leach, Dr. Leger, um, Dr. Linda Vickers, and we have also Dr. Hatun Izzet and Dr. Linda Foltz. I don't have their pictures. And as you can see, I am surrounded. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so what we do here at St. Paul's, um, of course, our major focus is a clinical. Um, we have outpatients clinic that runs um, five days a week. 
Um, we do outpatient chemotherapy. We have medical short stay unit um, on the uh, floor AD, uh, where we give chemotherapy, we give transfusions, we give um, medications. Um, we um, do procedures like bone marrow procedure. Um, we also do inpatient chemotherapy for those with um, high-grade diseases like intensive chemotherapy for patients with acute leukemia and Perkett's lymphoma. Um, so we basically we treat all malignant conditions here. We do um, uh, everything with the exception of bone marrow transplant. Um, on top of that, of course, we also manage um, benign hematology, um, all other cases of clotting problems and bleeding problems and stuff. Uh, the academic um, aspect of our division um, actually uh, includes teaching. Um, we are part of the um, UBC um, Department of Medicine. Um, medical students, and we train um, internal medicine residents and hematology fellows. Um, as to regard to the research, we um, develop uh, uh, databases or disease-specific databases. At the moment, we have a database for chronic lymphocytic leukemia, um, which um, has about 500 patients. Um, we see around 50 new CLL patients per year. Um, that's a total, I guess, of 200 in BC. Is that right, CLL? Yeah. Or I don't know how many CLL we see in BC. About 200. 200, yeah. Um, MDS, we have a database for MDS. We have a database for myeloproliferative diseases. That's polycythemia vera, um, essential thrombocytemia, and uh, myelofibrosis. We have a database for venous thrombosis. And we are in the process or thinking about actually developing a database for multiple myeloma. Um, we see about fifty, uh, uh, about thirty patients, new myeloma patients, um, thirty to forty patients a year. Um, so that's really a significant number. Um, we also have a clinical research office, and we participate in clinical studies. Um, there are mainly um, phase three clinical studies, but we also sometimes do phase two and clinical studies. We also participate in some lab studies. Um, we um, collaborate with um, uh, research labs, um, uh, uh, BC Cancer Agency research labs, and we send them samples. So I guess that's all what I wanted to say. Thank you very much for your attention.